Well, good morning. And uh, I just want to uh, take a moment to thank you for the privilege of sharing uh, in this week with you. It's hard to believe it's Friday already. And uh, I just want to thank you uh, for the privilege of sharing in this week with you. If you'll remember all the way back to Sunday night, which seems like forever ago, uh, I shared a couple of verses with you from Romans chapter 1. And one of those was verse 12. And it says, that is that we may, may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And I just want to know that you all have been a blessing to me and an encouragement to me. Thank you for letting me share this week with you. For you that will be back next week, looking forward to that. For you that, that, that don't or won't be able to, thank you for this week. If um, you are leaving and you'd like to stay in touch with me, uh, you can find me in these places. So uh, pretty easy to remember, just uh, Pastor Dan Davis. And I uh, would love to stay up in connection with you. Let me know how I can pray for you or encourage you. It's really my privilege and delight to do that. Also want to uh, remind you, uh, if, especially if you're leaving, but for all of you, make sure you take time before you leave to thank your faculty. We have an amazing group of faculty here, and they come here because they love you. They work endless hours to teach you. And when you all leave, um, sing time in the evening, they stay and pray for you. So uh, you have a faculty that love Jesus and love you, and I know they've poured into your lives. So make sure that you let them know uh, how much you appreciate their work in your life. And you could also thank your counselors, right, for putting up with you. Romans chapter 8. We are, we are finishing up this incredible chapter. I know that in, in, in many ways we've only very, very begun to scratch the surface of the richness of what God has to say to us in, in this text. But this morning, it's my prayer and, and my desire that, that from the verses that we're going to look at, that, that you would see an incredible picture of a God who is for you and a God who has great plans for your life. As we work through Romans chapter 8, we realize that we can go from our if-only regrets to what-if possibilities, and then we're called to live as if those things are true. So let's dive in. We're going to begin in verse 31, Romans chapter 8, and then move to the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 8, let's read verse 31 together. Paul says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? The things he's written about, the things we've been talking about. He says, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? Paul begins to conclude this marvelous section of his letter. And he says, he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? I believe that's the ultimate rhetorical question. That word there, if, can be translated since, right? And so he, he's not saying if is like if, if it's a maybe. He's saying since or if because God is for us, who can ever be against us? Right, and remember, Paul is writing to the church in Rome. They, they were a relatively small church in a huge city, in a city where there was a, a government that was in opposition to the faith of, in Christ. There was also persecution from, their, from Jewish people that were living in Rome. And so the believers in Rome and Paul himself, they weren't living in the best of times. They weren't living in the easiest of times. But Paul wanted them to know, and he would want us to know today, he says that no matter what our circumstances might be, no matter what we see going on around us in our lives and in the world, there's a truth that we need to be anchored to. That if you are in Christ, that if you know Jesus as your Savior, then God is for you. He's for you. And so he says, who can ever be against us? It's almost as he's saying, listen, if, if God is on your team, you can't lose. Or you can't lose. If God is on your team, you can't lose. And so in life, Paul is going to challenge these believers, and he would challenge us as well, to not hold back from living out the life God's called for you. You know, there's a lot of things that could cause us to pull back from the possibilities that God has given us. And we can let fear and all kinds of things get in the way of pursuing the possible that God has marked over our lives. And so Paul wants to encourage the believers in Rome and ultimately through the Spirit, us as well, to say, don't play it safe. My challenge for you today is, is to see that God is for you and then God calls you to live for Him. And He doesn't call you to hold back. 
in God's calling on your life, on the pursuits that He is calling you to. You can't lose. So here's the thing. In life, we get to play offense. Right? God hasn't called us to play defense. We're not, we're not holding the fort. Are you with me? We're not, we're not just trying to hang on. Right? We're more than conquerors. God is for us. And so we don't have to hold the fort. So play like you can't lose. However, this does not apply to Frisbee. You have to play defense, Angela. She knew this was coming. All right. It doesn't apply to Frisbee, but it does apply to life. You can't lose. Let's, let's go on and look at the reasons that Paul gives us, right? He doesn't just sort of throw this out there. He gives us reasons. He says in verse 32, Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? So Paul says, if you're doubting that, you know, God is for you, maybe the circumstances of your life, maybe the difficulties that you're in, maybe the evil that we see in the world and all the things that we wrestle with and deal with, and maybe those things and sometimes, as we said yesterday, the realities of life sometimes obscure our faith. And they make faith hard and they make hope hard. And so Paul says, listen, if God did not spare His Son, right, if He gave Jesus up to you, for you, on the cross, if He allowed His Son to experience the wrath and the horror of your sin, if He allowed Him to experience the judgment that we deserved, He allowed His Son to be forsaken. He allowed His Son to be mocked and spit on and slapped and humiliated and nailed to a cross. And He did all of that in order that He might rescue and redeem you and I and all who had placed their faith in Jesus from the curse and the consequence of sin. And if God did that, and if He was willing to do that, and if He was willing to give Him up for us, won't He also give us everything else? Luke 12, 32, I quoted it the other day. Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God is for us. What an amazing, amazing thought. And He is faithful. He's faithful to His promises, and He's faithful to complete the work that He's begun in you. You can trust that God will be faithful. Look at what Paul says as he continues to write, verse 33. He says, Who dare, who dare accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. And so once again, Paul's reminding them. He says, he says, God chose you, right? We talked about being adopted into the family of God. He purchased us. He bought us. He chose us for himself. And he says he's given us right standing. He's given us righteousness, right? So before God, you are in right standing. You are not guilty. Romans 8, 1, no condemnation. That's your position in Christ. And it's not based on your performance. It's not based on the fact that you were good, right? It's based on the fact that Jesus lived a life that you could not live. He lived a sinless and perfect life on your behalf and on my behalf. He died the death that we deserve to die. And he rose from the dead. Ascended to the Father, sits at the right hand, and He is coming again one day in glory and in power. And so Paul says, who dare accuse us? The enemy loves to accuse. But you are not condemned. That doesn't mean that, that we can just ignore our sin, right? Our sin affects our lives. It's a serious thing. In fact, because of this truth, we realize I can take my sin to God. I'm already forgiven and I can experience and live in that forgiveness when I confess my sin and, 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 and follow Jesus. But let's continue on. Verse 34. Who then will condemn us? Comes back to this theme of condemnation. Who will then condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us, was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. And so not only did, did Jesus die on the cross for you, not only did he raise to life again on the third day, but he is in heaven now praying for you. I want you to know today that, that God is for you. I mean, he, he said that in verse 31, and he says it here again. He says that, that Jesus died for us, that he was raised to life for us. God is for you. He's rooting you. He's rooting on for you. Right? God's not up in heaven hoping that you, that you fail or you mess up or waiting to catch you. Right? You're his child. He wants nothing more for you to see than to see him for who he is. 
to see his love and his mercy and his grace and his goodness and to trust him and to live for him. God is for you. And nothing can ever stop God from loving his children. Listen, there's nothing. Your sin, your failures, your shortcomings, nothing will ever stop God from loving you. There's never a moment, even at your worst moments, God loves you. Listen, when Jesus chose you, when God saved you, right, before the foundation of the world, when God chose you in Christ, listen, he knew everything about you and he knew all the times that you would fail him and he still chose you. He loves you. Listen, there's nothing. These are my kids. You've seen them running around. If you look down at the bottom of the screen, that's our, their pet turtle. Um, <laughs> they call him Turdy. Um, <laughs> I call him Lunchbox. So, but... Listen, they're not always that cute and adorable, I promise. But listen, there's nothing that they could ever do to make me not love them. Nothing. There's nothing they could ever do to make me not love them. Nothing. And there's nothing that you can or ever will do if you're God's child that will ever stop his incredible love for you. Look at what Paul continues to say in verse 35. Can anything anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? For as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day and we are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And listen, this wasn't just theory for Paul. This was his testimony. This was his story. As he wrote to the church in Rome who was experiencing these difficulties, they were also things that Paul himself had experienced. This is, this is Paul's diary. This is his testimony. Paul knew about trouble and calamity and persecution and hunger and destitution and danger, threatened with death. These were things that Paul lived under, lived with. Listen, Jesus did not promise that life would be easy or without trouble. Right? But what he did promise was that he gives us victory in spite of those things, in the face of those things. Look at what he says in verse 37. Despite, despite what is real and what is happening and all the things that go on in life, he says overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I like to win. You may have figured that out if you played Frisbee with me. Anybody else like to win? It's good. It's a positive thing, right? It, there's nothing wrong with, with wanting to win. And what I love about my position in Christ and your position in Christ is we are in a position of overwhelming victory. In Oct on October 7th, 1916, the Georgia Tech football team beat Cumberland College by the score of 222 to 0. Now, I know some of you aren't football fans and you don't know a lot about football, but you don't need to know anything about football to know that what? That's overwhelming victory. And it, it could have been worse because Cumberland College actually blocked one of Georgia Tech's extra point attempts. I'm sure it was the only, they probably got so excited and high-fived and ran off the field. That's overwhelming victory. They were coached by a man named John Heisman. Heisman Trophy. Overwhelming victory. The Greek word here for this word is, is it literally means over conquerors or hyper conquerors. And so I, I kind of like that, that label, hyper conqueror. All right? That's your label. That's, that's who you are. And so right now, I, wa I want you to, to turn to the person next to you and just say, I I'm a hyper conqueror. <laughs> All right. Listen, you may even want to. You may even want to pull your name tag out of its little pouch and just write under your name, Hyper Conqueror, all right? You can introduce yourself this way from now on. You say, hi, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Dan, I'm, I'm a Hyper Conqueror. You go, what? <laughs> it's true, it's who you are in Christ. You're not a victim, you're the victor. Simply because of who God is and what Jesus has done. Paul goes on, he says, I am convinced, persuaded, Rock solid confidence that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing. And Paul knew about hardship. He knew about persecution. He was beaten to within inches of death. He was thrown into prison. And ultimately one day will be martyred. He will be beheaded for his faith in Christ. But Paul says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death 
nor life, nor angels, nor demons, our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow. You ever have any worries about tomorrow? All right. But, you know, we all struggle with fear and worry. But he says, even our fears and our worries cannot separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or on the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you. Even the worst things that may happen to you in life, even in the face of evil and even in the face of death, right? Because we talked about we have resurrection hope. Right? We, have, we have been given a promise by God that we will experience His resurrection life, new bodies, new creation. And so even in the face of death, we have an unflinchable hope because death has been defeated. Life will bring hard moments, but nothing, nothing can separate you from God's love. He loves you with a fierce and unending love. And listen, Paul didn't just believe this. He banked his eternity on it. And he staked his eternal destiny to the belief that God loved him and that Jesus died for him. He banked his eternity on it. In England, which according to uh, Dr. White, I believe, is an insignificant country south of Scotland. Is that correct? <laughs> but is that a true story? Yeah. It's a true story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was listening online. But in England, before uh, their entrance to World War II, they, they came up with some slogans to encourage the people. And, and the first one was this. They said, your courage, your cheerfulness, and your resolution will bring us victory. Yeah, pretty good. Um, I think it, would, it might work for Frisbee too, so we, we could try that. The next one they came up with was, freedom is in peril. Freedom is in peril. A motivation to do something because freedom is at stake. The third one was, was printed on nearly two and a half million posters, but it was never distributed for some reason. And it was this. Ever heard of that one? <laughs> All right. It was found years later. They never distributed it, but it was found years later. And of course now endless parodies and memes and all kinds of things have been played off this statement. But listen, it fits here. Right? It, Paul's saying, if, if you're in Christ, if you've believed on Him as your Savior, if you've accepted the grace that He offers to you through Jesus, if you've believed on Him in faith, and Jesus is your Savior and your Lord, he says, if, if that is true, right, that we can keep calm and carry on because God has us in His hand. We are more than conquerors, and God is for us. He is with us. Nothing can separate us from His love. Nothing can separate us from the hope that we have in Him. We have the confidence that God is working all things together for good, right? For those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Listen, I believe with all my heart that God is for you because God's Word says it so clearly. Paul says, if God is for us, I want you to, to, to walk away from this week understanding who Jesus is, the greatness and the glory and the splendor of our Savior, what He's done for you, what He offers you, and what He calls you to now based on what He has done for you. He is for you. And because He is for you, we can live for Him. Right? He has saved us not just so that we can go to heaven. He has saved us that we might know Him and love Him and worship Him and serve Him and fulfill His purposes in our life and in our generation. You see, the goal of the Christian life is not to arrive safely at death. The goal of the Christian life isn't to get to death safely, but sadly, isn't that how many of us often tend to live the Christian life? Let me just try to stay safe and comfortable and, and just and manage my life and I'll go to heaven one day. And so I just want to get to death safely. I mean, God does not call us to play it safe. He doesn't call us to hold back, right? We are more than conquerors. God is for us. Overwhelming victory is ours. And so the goal of our life is to boldly fulfill the purposes for which God has saved us for. God created you anew in Christ Jesus for good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And so I just want to ask you one more time. What if, 
What if you lived as if what Jesus said was true? What could happen if you would take Jesus seriously and you lived as if what he has said is true? Maybe you've been holding back. I want to challenge you to go all in with God, to risk giving him all of you because he gave himself for you. Many, many years ago, there was a man named Edward Kimball, Sunday school teacher, just an ordinary man who taught Sunday school in his church. In one day, a, a new student came to his class, a 17-year-old young man who was only going to church because he was being made to. Some of you may be able to identify. He had grown up in a very difficult circumstances. His father had died when he was four. They were very poor and very destitute. He had come to live with his uncle, and his uncle had given him a job. But he said, if you're going to live here and you're going to work for me, guess where you're going to be on Sunday? In church. And this young man had a hard heart and an even harder exterior. But Edward Kimball loved him, shared Jesus' love with him, and the simple truth that God loved him, that Jesus died for him, began to penetrate this young man's heart. And he came to know and trust Jesus as a Savior. But listen, listen to what was said about this man. This is what was recorded about this man. He says, I can truly say, this is Edward Kimball, the Sunday school teacher. I can truly say, and in saying it, I magnify the infinite grace of God as were bestowed upon him, that I have seen few persons whose minds were spiritually darker than his when he came into my Sunday school class. And I think that the committee of Mount Vernon Church seldom met an applicant for membership more unlikely to ever become a Christian of clear and decided views of gospel truth and still less to fill any extended sphere of public usefulness. Can we say ouch together? That's harsh, right? He says, seldom met an applicant for membership more unlikely ever to become a Christian of clear and decided views of, of gospel truth. He said, man, we don't think this guy could even ever get the gospel. He's so hard and so far and so gone, right? But no one is ever so far and so hard and so gone that the love of God and the grace of Jesus can't reach into their life. But then he said, not only that, but even if he did come to Christ, there's no way that he would be, ever be useful. There's no way that he could ever do anything to glorify God. And yet Dwight L. Moody did. He trusted Jesus as his Savior. God began to change him. Dwight L. Moody impacted his generation like no one else. And his influence and his legacy and impact lives on today. D.L. Moody trusted Christ, but he was still a poorly educated, unordained shoe salesman who felt the call to preach the gospel. And one day he gathered with some of his friends in a hayfield for a season of prayer and confession. And his friend named Henry Varley said these words. He said, the world is yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Those words stuck into his mind and sometime later, he had the privilege of hearing Charles Spurgeon preach. And as Charles Spurgeon was preaching, he was doing probably what some of you do. He was allowing his mind to wander. All right? Any confession? Right? Hey, I've been there. It's okay. God works even through the wandering of our minds. And God worked that day through the wandering of his mind. And he began to think about what his friend had said. And he said, you know what? You know what my friend said? He said, he said God could do anything. And he didn't say that it had to be an exceptionally intelligent person. He didn't have to be a very talented person. Just any person. He says any person who's fully and consecrated in him, God could use. And he started to realize, he said, he said Mr. Spurgeon, who's preaching, it's, it's not even about him. It's God who's giving him the ability to do that. And if God can do that in him and for him, God can do it in and through me. And so D.L. Moody said this. He says, I realized it was not Mr. Spurgeon at all who was doing that work. It was God. And if God could use Mr. Spurgeon, why could he not use the rest of us? And why should we not all just lay ourselves at the master's feet and say to him, send me, use me. 
You see, God is looking for people who would see him for who he is and realize the grace and the mercy that he's lavished on them and then realize that he has called each of us to give our lives to live for him and his kingdom and to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, to share the hope and the love that this world needs. I want to ask you, are you an ordinary person that God could use in an extraordinary way if you would say yes to God? based on what he's done for you, based on who he is. Listen, our world is in great turmoil. Our world is broken, and there are, there are over two billion people who have yet to hear the name of Jesus. And God is looking for a generation who will rise up and use the gifts and the talents that he's given them, wholly dedicated to him, to serve his purposes. What if you lived as if what Jesus said was true? I want to invite you and ask you to ask God to do extraordinary things through your life. Ask, say, God, would you use me in an extraordinary way, not for myself, not for my fame, not for my glory, but for you and for your kingdom and for your glory? What could God do in and through you if you said yes to God? Would you bow your heads this morning? I'm so thankful for this week that we've had to share together. And I believe and I've been praying that, that God would change the, the shape of eternity by what happens here this week. I believe with all my heart that God has an amazing possible marked over every one of your lives. He loves you. He saved you. You're not condemned. You're free. And you're free not to go back to your old life, not to live for yourself and not to live for your own glory, but you're free to live for the one who gave himself up for you. You're free to live for the one who died for you. Overwhelming victory is yours. God is for you. He is with you. And would you be willing then to say yes to God? To say, God, you can have my yes. Whatever, wherever, whenever. However, take me, use me. The world is yet to see what God could do in and through and for a man who is fully consecrated to him. Father, I pray that every one of us would realize the great possible you've marked over our lives. Father, I pray that every one of us would realize the depth of your love. And Father, I pray right now that you might call each of us to give our yes to you. Take our lives and use them for your glory. Use them to advance the message of Jesus and his kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.